Building a cloud chamber is an interesting project and can be useful for uh, science demonstrations from grade school all the way up through college. Uh, the question is though, after you've done that, is it good for anything? Is there a repeatable hobby that you can use this for? And I'm happy to say that there is. The closest analogy is astronomy, where you buy a telescope and once a month or so you drag it out into the night to look at stars or nebulas, galaxies, whatever interests you. In the same way, you can pull out your cloud chamber, fire it up whenever you have the desire, and instead of looking for stars or uh, galaxies, you look for interesting particle tracks. The best way to do this is to make sure you have a transparent area in the top of the cloud chamber. You mount a camera here, a video camera, looking straight down, and you record your tracks. You do this for a half an hour to an hour or so, you'll get thousands, tens of thousands of tracks. Then you play this back at slow motion and single out the tracks that are the most interesting. And some of these can be unbelievable. Let's look at some examples. If you look down into a cloud chamber, this is the sort of thing you'll see. Tracks of all different sizes and shapes appearing and disappearing, usually lasting about a second each. And that's the problem. They come and go so quickly, it's difficult to figure out what they're doing, what's happening. And that's why using a camera, a video camera, is so useful. It allows you to slow down the, the, uh, the action and even do freeze frames to capture the tracks at their best, which enables you to not only identify what particles you're looking at, but also how they're interacting with the uh, atoms in the cloud chamber. The following segments will help identify what the various particle types are and how to interpret the tracks that they create. Okay, here's a typical freeze frame from uh, a video I took of my cloud chamber. The camera is looking straight down and uh, the frame is about six inches side to side, four inches top to bottom to give you a reference. The low energy beta particles are these short tracks that are maybe an inch long. They can be shorter or slightly longer. They're the most numerous tracks by far you'll find. And here's what it looks like as you frame forward through the segment. Let's go on to some medium energy beta particles. If you could keep an eye on this part of the screen, I'll frame forward and you'll see the appearance of a medium energy beta particle. And here it is. It's quite a bit longer than the low energies. These actually can range anywhere from two to four inches. But as you can see, it's following a very convoluted path, typical of a low energy particle. Because it's moving so slowly, it's easily knocked around. Next, let's look at some high energy particles. Pretty though, isn't it? The high energy beta particle will appear in this part of the screen. And there it is. It can easily be six inches long, and while it's still following a bent path, it is considerably straighter than the medium energy particle. we're going to see an alpha particle appear right here. And there it is. It's a lot brighter and denser than beta particles because an alpha particle is doubly ionized. It is a plus two charge. It is the helium atom ejected from uh, radioactive radon as it decays. Radon's a naturally occurring gas. They tend to be about an inch long and very straight because they're so heavy, many thousands of times heavier than a beta particle, they're not easily knocked out of alignment. They're much rarer than uh, beta particles, uh, particularly after the 
cloud chamber has been operating for uh, say a half an hour because all of the radon that's uh, been trapped inside the chamber decays and there's nothing left to produce uh, more alpha particles. About this time you may be asking, okay, uh, I understand where alpha particles come from and that's fine, but where do all of these beta particles come from? I mean, there's hundreds, thousands every minute. And um, that's a kind of a vexing problem because the reality is that it, even the highest energy beta particle doesn't have enough energy to punch through the walls of uh, the cloud chamber. I mean, most of them can't even go an inch in the, the atmosphere of the cloud chamber. So where do they come from? The answer is, is they are produced inside the chamber. And what produces them is quite literally the 500 pound gorilla in the cloud chamber, the muon. Let's frame forward and see what one looks like. And there it is. While most beta particles, like this one, or maybe a few thousand to hundred thousands of electron volts, and the most energetic beta particles are up around a million or two million electron volts, a muon is usually rated at sea level at four billion, that's billion with a B, electron volts. It is so powerful that it blasts through the cloud chamber like a cannonball through tissue paper. Not only does it have an enormous amount of energy, it also weighs about 200 times as much as an electron. So uh, these things practically never stop. And uh, where they come from is cosmic rays strike the upper atmosphere of the Earth and are converted into muons which shower down on us by the trillions every second. Fortunately, uh, they are a uh, fairly benign radiation so they don't hurt us. But this is not to say that they never interact. Occasionally a muon traveling through the cloud chamber will spontaneously decay into a beta particle and a few other non-charged particles which we can't see. When that happens, you'll see the track coming along nice and straight and all suddenly it'll make a sharp turn upward. And the odds are what's happened is it it's either interacted with an atom close enough to actually turn it or it is decayed and the uh, resulting beta particle is going off at an angle. So the answer to the question where do all the beta particles come from? They come from muons either interacting with atoms or spontaneously decaying into a beta particle. Muon tracks are straighter and usually slightly fainter than even the highest energy beta particle. Every particle will show some sort of curvature except for maybe a muon. Uh, this is very typical but many times the curves will take on very interesting shapes as the following will show. Now at first you might think that uh, this is the whole track. Actually it starts up here as probably a high energy beta particle, interacts with an atom here, makes a fairly sharp turn, and then it's hard to see but there's a faint line of ionized particles coming down this way where it interacts with uh, another atom and now it's uh, slowed down enough so that the uh, track becomes much brighter. Also, it's probably entered a more active cloud producing zone. It follows on down, losing energy, making more and more turns, and eventually dies at this point. A lot of these curves can be even more interesting this, than this one. Lots of times what I like to do is take one of these, do a screen capture, and clean all of the other material uh, off of the image so all I have is the track and to print it out in a, uh, uh, for a permanent record. Next to curves, the most common uh, track you'll see is a bend. Here's one very slight bend. Here's another, a little bit more gentle curve, but if we frame forward, we'll come to a little bit uh, more interesting one. Okay, 
right here we have what appears to be a very sharp turn. Now there's two ways of looking at this. This could be either a muon decaying into an electron and taking off that way, or it could be a high energy uh, beta particle that interacted with an atom and was turned and went this way. As far as the direction of motion is concerned, in, uh, in general, the faster a particle is moving, the higher its energy, uh, the thinner the track will be because it has less time to interact with the atoms. In this case, you can see this is very thin here. It loses some energy as it's turned, and this track down here is a little bit uh, denser, a little thicker. So my guess is that uh, an electron, a uh, beta particle, because they're more common than muons in a cloud chamber, came down here, interacted with an atom, was turned, and took off this way. Here's another example, this time a much sharper bend. Occasionally, a beta particle will interact with an atom so violently that it will not only get turned, but will eject a second beta particle. Here's an example. Starting at the top, we have a medium or high energy beta particle coming down, interacting with an atom, getting turned and eventually decaying down to zero energy and get being absorbed, but it also kicked out a second low energy beta particle this way. Some forks have the beta particle coming off at a perpendicular angle and making a small hook so that they look like a coat hanger. Delta rays are such low energy coat hangers that the coat hanger part just looks like a little lump. The trace in the lower right has two of them. Again in the lower right, you have one that's half coat hanger, half delta. Here we have a medium energy beta particle coming in from the lower bottom, sending off a sloppy coat hook, and then wandering around to end its life at the end of a hook. This track has a high energy beta particle coming in from the right, sending off a sloppy coat hook, and then following down in a graceful curve to the lower left. In the upper right, a medium energy beta particle follows a curved path until it gets slammed with four sharp bends to create a box shape. This track makes me think of a long skinny man with a very tiny head crawling around on all fours. Look near the top and you'll see a wizard's cap. This time in the upper right, we have a sad little mutant coat hanger. Here we have one of the most unusual traces I've ever seen. Watch this little spot right here as I click forward. As you can see, it almost looks like a little comet moving down to the lower left corner. Now this confused me for a long time because all of the tracks that you see are, are produced so quickly, they're virtually instantaneous, and yet here's a spot moving very slowly, and it took me a lot, long time to figure out what that is. What that is. Uh, what's happening is, imagine this beta particle right here except instead of it going along the plane of the cloud chamber, the active cloud producing zone in the cloud chamber, it's almost perpendicular to it so that it's piercing the cloud chamber from top to bottom. Now because the particles that are forming the cloud are falling down, as that uh, stream, if you will, of ionized particles penetrates the active layer of the cloud, it creates this hot spot in a little tail. So it looks like a little particle moving this way, but it's actually a, a line of uh, 
uh, already ionized particles extending above the cloud chamber and slowly drifting down at an angle to make it look like it's moving. It's a very interesting phenomena. I've only seen this, uh, this happen once. Here it is at normal speed. These examples give you an idea of the types of tracks you're likely to see in a cloud chamber. Although cloud chambers these days are considered uh, novelty science projects and even toys, it has to be remembered that 140 years ago, these were the premier instruments that the physicists of the time used to begin unlocking the true nature of the universe, and as such, they deserve considerable respect. Which is not to say they can't be an awful lot of fun. I sincerely hope you found this video entertaining and informative, and as always, thank you very much for watching.